Sandra Herndon. I'm the president of the Thurston League of Women Voters, and we are delighted to have you here this evening. We have an outstanding program, which is also going to be videotaped and should become available on our website, I believe, um, in short order. I'd like to call your attention to our website for a variety of reasons. LWVThurston.org, that's going to appear in various discussions, and so it's very important that you be familiar with that. I want to say just a few words about the League of Women Voters for those of you who might not know already. Next month, the League will be 100 years old. The League was established around the time of women's the women's suffrage movement, um, and it was part of that effort to get women informed so that they could be um, good voters. Let me say a few words about this organization. We are an activist, grassroots uh, organization. We provide vital information for voters. We are nonpartisan. That is to say, we do not support or oppose candidates or parties, but we advocate for vital issues. Um, and we uh, invite you to take a look at our membership material over here. If you haven't registered to vote, we hope you will do that promptly. Um, the TRI brochures, that's T-R-Y, they represent you, are available over here, almost hot off the press. How many of you are familiar with the TRI brochures? Good, all right. This is a list of all of the elected officials and their contact information, very important, so you can be in touch with them and tell them what you think. Um, we also have the civics textbook that the League has produced. It's over, it's just arrived over on that table as well. And we have another book that one of our speakers will talk about. Um, they're there for you to look at, and I encourage you also to look ahead at the website under the uh, upcoming events link because that will tell you the kinds of things we're going to be doing for the rest of this spring. This is the kickoff event for a series of events that will take place into, the, uh, into May. So I encourage you to look those things up and to um, come and join us in various programs and committees and activities, and we look forward to seeing you there. So I have a question for you. How many of you know who Elbridge Jerry was? All right, yes, one person. Uh, I'm sure you've heard the term gerrymandering. Well, Elbridge Jerry uh, is the origin of part of that term. And the, uh, the issue was that the, uh, in, in Massachusetts, let me get this straight now so I don't mistake. He was governor of Massachusetts in 1812. He signed a bill that created a partisan district in the Boston area that was compared to the shape of a mythical salamander. Therefore, gerrymander uh, took on the, the slang term for this kind of partisan district uh, drawing. And you're going to hear much more about that kind of issue tonight. Um, let me introduce very briefly our presenters tonight, and then Peggy Smith, who's organized this whole event, will introduce individuals in much more detail and give us some framework. Our guests are Lisa McLean with the State Office of Financial Management Coordinator of the Statewide 2020 Census Outreach. Would you raise your hand when I call your name? Thank you. <laughs> Sherry Sullivan works with Multicultural Populations, longtime Cielo board member. Lynn Crowley, heavily involved in the local Asian community and serves as co-chair of the South Puget Sound chapter of the statewide Asian Pacific Islander Coalition. So I'll turn the program over to Peggy.
Thank you, Peggy Smith, and I am glad to be here. Glad to see all of you. Uh, just a couple of logistics. The staff here suggested that we lock that door this way to my right, because sometimes people use this as a byway for something. And then the other logistical note is that the restrooms are to my left. Other than that, I think we're ready to go. We're going to, um, I love this word, we're going to bifurcate this evening, if that's okay with you. We're going to start on the census. The 2002 census comes first. Once everyone is counted, then that data is used for excuse me, proportioning um, all sorts of things. So to begin, we're going to have three speakers on the census, starting with Lisa McLean, who you've met. And as you know, she serves as the, 20, the 2020 census coordinator from the Office of Financial Management. And she has brought a number of informational and utility items that you can help yourself with. She brings 25 years of experience managing nonpartisan grassroots organizing projects. And this is going to be vital as she spearheads the state's effort to educate and build awareness around the 2020 census. She will be presenting a uh, semi, a formal, a formal talk. And then after she speaks, we will have two community organizing type persons involvement talking about populations that may be hard to reach. Um, first is Sherry Sullivan. She is a retired faculty member from the South Puget Sound Community College, where she taught a course in multicultural America that you know, spurred her interest in this area, as well as teaching humanities and English. As Sandra mentioned, she's a longtime board member of Cielo. She served as their chair, and now she's also involved in other community activities, one of them is the cultural round, uh, I'm sorry, the <laughs> Hispanic round table, and then um, the sanctuary program that strengthening sanctuaries, which is a coalition, and we'll be having a program more directed towards that later in the spring. So as Sandra said, be sure and check our website. And then we have, as our third speaker, Lynn Crowley, and she is a Chinese faculty member from the Evergreen State College. In addition to being co-chair of the South Puget Sound chapter of the statewide Asian Pacific Islander Coalition, she is the census area manager as well. She also is active in other com uh, community organizations. Notably, she is the chair of both the Refugee and Immigration Service Center and Thurston Community Television. And I'm so glad she could carve out some time to be with us. So I'm going to let these persons um, orchest orchestrate their own presentations and when, um, they are through and exhausted, but no later than uh, what time is on your, everybody look at your agenda, uh, 6.30. We'll have a break at 6.30. Okay. Come on. I was just saying that they've, these two have heard this uh, presentation already, so they can take a little break. <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, let me move this down a little bit. There we go. Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Lisa, and I work for the Office of Financial Management. And I just wanted to want to give you a presentation about what to expect 
when it comes to the census, and I'll tell you a little bit about what's on the table there um, and about what we're doing here in the state. Um, but this census is going to be a little bit different than the ones in the past, and I think there's a lot of confusion. I was just on the phone today with somebody who like works at the demographer's office in Houston, um, and the person didn't have all the facts straight, so it's it's really kind of specific. You know, we we want to get the facts straight. Number one, so that we can know how to participate ourselves, but also so that we can explain to other people because I think there's a lot of confusion out there. So we know what the decennial census is. It comes along at once every 10 years. Um, it's a opportunity for us to get a portrait of the nation. Um, and uh, the goal is to count everyone once and only once and in the right place, okay? One of the things that we sometimes forget, and I find myself in so many audiences, you probably maybe know this better, the date is April 1, 2020. When we used to basically do the enumeration where all the enumerators went and knocked on doors on April 1, 2020, we knew that it was April 1, 2020. Now it's actually not, it's gonna start earlier, we can fill it out earlier, we can fill it out later. So it basically, but the important reason why we call it April 1, 2020 is because that's the idea about where do you live and sleep most of the time as of April 1, 2020. Okay, so that's like that's to locate ourselves, even if we fill it out on March 23rd. Okay, um, and it is uh, required by law for us to do it, but it's also our civic duty. So um, why does it matter? Um, I got this. I stole this uh, slide or this idea from my good friend from Washington nonprofits. Um, it really comes down to the three dot, three D's: democracy, how we uh, distribute our, how we. Uh, affect our gerrymandering or redistricting, if we want to call it that, <laughs> okay. and how we can get our representation, right? And if you remember, in case you don't remember, is in 2010, we got an extra seat here in Washington State. Um, so we now have 10 people. According to the projections, uh, we are not projected to get another seat. There was some analysis last year that seemed to say that if we kept uh, growing at a certain pace, we could get another seat, but that uh, analysis has been updated and it's almost positive we're not gonna get a new seat, we're not gonna lose one. Um, we're just gonna, we can stay at 10. Uh, and then data, obviously uh, businesses, uh, schools, um, all kinds of decision making is informed by the data that we can collect from the census. And that's uh, really important to uh, small businesses, to uh, where we have health centers, clinics, um, I mean, one, there's a presentation that I do with my colleagues from the Office of Financial Management where we talk about how we can actually use this data to project about what the population is going to look like and how, f like, that there we're going to have a whole lot more senior citizens in the coming decades, and therefore we have to think about that and plan for that. That's data that we get from the census. And then the big one, the one that we're using all the time now to convince people to take part in this is it comes down to dollars, okay? There is the state, the in. FY 2016, in the fiscal year 2016, the federal government gave out $880 billion. And of that, $16.7 billion came here into Washington State based on census data. And that is money that's for, um, for health programs, for education, for housing, uh, for rural assistance programs, and almost a billion dollars in uh, transportation uh, funds. There's an entire, there's a sheet you can get on my website, on our website, where you can see the 55 programs and how much money was uh, came to this state because of the census count. So it's really, really important. One of the ways to think about it is that it's really, it each census form in 2016 added up to about $2,319 per person, or if you think about it in terms of households, if we were to miss 100 households, then we're, we're uh, leaving $5.8 million on the table that won't come to this, this state. So, because if we don't get the count right on the, uh, in 2020, the count in 2021 is not gonna be right, or the one in 2022. Those are the ones that we do it here, because we are using the basic data we get on the 2020 census. So that's why it's really, really important. So one missing person is missed for the entire time. Another thing, there's a big problem with uh, counting young children. The lots of, uh, about a, it was a, a four to five percent undercount of young children in the last uh, census. And uh, if you think about that, if you like, if you miss your grandchild, you're missing that person for the next 10 years doesn't exist actually. 
So this is, the, this is the big argument we're trying to use to try to convince people to fill out the census form. Take the time, okay? Um, so this year, uh, the 2020 census is going to be online. Uh, it's not going to be only online, but you are going to be able to go online and fill it out, and you're going to be able to use a computer to do that, a smart form, a phone, or a tablet. In addition, you can call in your responses if you'd like to, and you will have a paper copy eventually delivered to your home address. Here's the way this thing's gonna do, happen. is basically starting between March 12th and March 20th, you're going to get uh, mail in your mailbox that's going to invite you to go online or make a telephone call and, uh, um, and fill out the census form, okay? Uh, then you'll get another mailing uh, uh, reminder, and then a, set, a third reminder, and on the fourth one, April 8th uh, to the 16th, then you'll get the paper copy will come in the mail for you to fill out, fill out the form, okay? And then you'll get a final reminder on April 30th, and only then are people going to start going around and knocking on your doors. So the actual, what's called a non-response follow-up does not actually start until May 13th. Again, something I, I hear from a lot of people is, oh, I know what the census is, that's that door knocking exercise. Actually, it's not the door knocking exercise because by the time they're knocking on your door, we got a problem. Because actually, in fact, how many of us have no soliciting signs on our door? Okay. How many of us, uh, how many of us basically uh, don't like to answer the door when people come to it, right? So the best way is for us to self-respond. When we get the invitation, we should go online, pick up the telephone, uh, and make, uh, and fill the thing out because the person, the most reliable census is the one where I say, you know who lives in this house? I'll tell you who lives in this house. That's the best one. Not for us. If they can't find you at home, they're going to ask your neighbor. And your neighbor's going to be like, well, I don't know, there's, like, there's lots of people coming in and out, I don't know, I don't think anybody really lives there. So we get inaccuracies, right? So that's, we don't want, we don't want that. Self-response is the goal, self-response. So the questionnaire is, ten, what, we're, what the state's campaign is all about is that it takes 10 minutes to answer 10 questions uh, that will affect um, investments in your community for the next 10 years, okay? So what are those 10 questions? There's actually, there are actually only nine questions. But, but I, I don't really need to tell that because, you know, it doesn't work. You can't say nine questions for um, 10 minutes. Anyway, um, the questions are going to be your name, your sex, your age. They're also going to ask your date of birth because if you're like me, you actually don't know your age, you know your date of birth, and sometimes those don't match up. Um, and then they're gonna ask you about your race and your ethnicity, and they're gonna ask you if the resident owns or rent their home, and then they're gonna ask for a phone number. The phone number is only so that they can follow up with you in the event that something is not clear, okay? That's what, that's what the process is. Um, and what's the other thing? They'll also, they, they will recommend that the person who fills out the form is the person who pays the mortgage or pays the rent in that household, um, and then afterwards you, talk about how everybody else in the family relates to, or how everybody else in the household relates to um, uh, the person who's person number one, okay? Um, and one thing about race and ethnicity in terms of, especially some of the things that we worry about here in terms of hard to count, please be aware of the fact that what the first question you're gonna come across when we talk about race and ethnicity is gonna say, are you Hispanic? And you're gonna and you say yes, and yes from Mexico, yes from uh, South America. And then afterwards, as a question is, what is your race? And that's where you can say you're white, or you're black, or you're, you could actually mark as many boxes as possible. I'm concerned in this current atmosphere that people are going to be worried about that fact that why are they asking me if I'm Hispanic, okay? We've been doing that for, I think, since 1970, okay? And we do it because of the fact that the Office of, of uh, Management and Budget in Washington, D.C. considers Hispanic to be an ethnicity, not a race, okay? But we were on track to have the largest uh, race be other because Hispanics didn't see themselves in the race question, okay? So what they do is they put the Hispanic question right up front so that the Hispanics feel you know, recognize, right? And, they, and then they say, okay, one, you've answered you are Hispanic, now are you white? Are you black? 
Are you Asian? You know, you can put, put on those things. So that's the reason why, so if anybody asks, they're not, this is so, not something new. It's got nothing to do with the citizenship question. It's been around for about, uh, what's that, 50 years. Um, the um, census form is going to be available in uh, Spanish and English as a, um, uh, as a paper form and on the tablet when you, the enumerators come around. But the online and the phone is going to be available in these, uh, the English and these 12 languages. Okay? And you can actually go right now, you can go to the Census Bureau's website and you can already see the, um, the different um, uh, languages, uh, of these 12 languages, and, and find information. They're already putting out stuff in these uh, 12 languages. In addition, and again, in addition, they've got another 46 languages. So 46 plus 12 equals 59, okay, in which they have language guides and video guides. So you can actually watch a guide to how the online uh, form is going to work in 59 different languages. And if you're interested in what languages those are, I have, there's something up on the website that tells you um, what the languages are, and you can also go and find them in the Census Bureau's uh, website, okay? So they've done a lot uh, there. I think it's very important, let me stop here on strong confidentiality protections. Everybody is very concerned about, a lot, there's a lot of fear. There's an extreme lot of fear. You all know there is no citizenship question on the census form. Okay, but at the same time, there's still a lot of fear, and so it's very important to know that Census Bureau employees are bound by Title 13. They take an oath to keep information confidential for the duration of their, um, of their lives, okay? If they fail in that oath, they're gonna be uh, fined uh, $250,000 or have to be five years in prison or both, okay? And it's very important that census responses are, um, they're used for statistical purposes only, okay, and they cannot be used against you, okay? So it's very important for people to understand if you write something down, when you hit that, on, when you hit submit, immediately the information is being encrypted, okay, and it will go to the Census Bureau and only Census Bureau will only use the data of the male, the female, the, 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 those datas, okay? It's, and, and the race and ethnicity, is ethnicity data. They will not go and find Lisa McLean, okay? I mean, and I can get into something in, about this. They've even introduced something new to, because they've kind of figured out that maybe there's a, a way that you can track back information given the fact of how much information's online right now. There's something called differential privacy. They're actually adding noise to the statistics in order to make sure that you can never kind of peel away all of the information to find out who's, uh, to, to, to get down to yourself. And that information, the census form, the individual census form stays, uh, stays um, uh, what, it, it's, it's uh, private until, for 72 years. So for those of you who might be doing some of your ancestry, you might have seen somebody's census form, but you haven't seen a census form for somebody in, from 1970. You only can see the census forms from 1940 because 72 years has, have passed. So 17, uh, 1940 and earlier is when you see that. So really good, to, really, really important to emphasize just how much the Census Bureau really, really wants you to know that they want to keep this information uh, confidential. They, you know, that process kind of pained them. Okay, they won't say it exactly, but we want to basically make sure that we tell people that this information is going to be confidential. It will not be tracked back to you individually. But some people are hard to get be counted. And the reason why they're hard to be counted is because of the fact that they are, sorry, I can't see it from over here, so I have to look at this. They usually fall into one of these categories. They are hard to interview because of language barriers, uh, because of literacy issues. In this case, because of digital liter literacy, perhaps, that might be a problem. They might be hard to persuade because they're suspicious of government. They have low levels of civic engagement, generally low levels of civic engagement. This is where this uh, confidentiality issue is gonna be probably important to come in. They might be hard to contact because they're highly mobile, because they're experiencing homelessness, um, or because they're living in physical, uh, they, physical barriers, right? Um, behind gated communities and stuff like that, or 
um, it, something like that. And then the last one is that they're hard to locate. And that's something that we, the state, have been working on for a very long time together with the cities and the counties to basically make sure that the Census Bureau's master address frame is right. But at the same time, uh, there, right now, we're, the Census Bureau is about to begin this operation to find places like service-based enumeration, make sure that they have a good list of their group quarters, um, and, and the like. So you know, there's still some work going on, but that pretty much kind of the hard to locate is kind of on us, and we've been trying to do a lot of work on that. The challenge is, is that the, these types of people usually fall into these categories. They can be young children, highly mobile, living in complex uh, living situations, crowded housing. They can be racial and ethnic minorities. They can be low income. They could be experiencing homelessness. And they could be undocumented or documented immigrants. It's actually some, there's some research that showed that documented immigrants from the Middle East were people who've been here for, for uh, like third generation uh, Middle Easterners were more unlikely to fill out the form than somebody who just arrived uh, last week. And you think about that as Middle Easterners that nowadays in order to get a visa to come to the United States have to sort of, you know, write down there, they give way more information than the 10 questions that we have on the census, right? So that's an interesting uh, kind of uh, thing. So this is, the, this is what our challenge is. Um, Washington is concerned about an undercount and that's why I have a job, and a couple of other people have a job. We're worried about the fear and the distrust that uh, has been growing in government, not just state government, not just federal government, but also state government. Um, we're worried about a general level of apathy, a lack of understanding about why this is so important, um, and people will think it just doesn't matter. We need to explain to those, think about all those 18 and what, 22-year-olds that weren't around in the last census, their parents took care of it. We need to explain to them how important this is. Um, we're worried about the complicated information scene, which I think we all know about the complicated information scene. But just think about it. That mail's gonna start arriving in our mailboxes right at the exact same time that we're having a primary here, okay? Can you imagine? I mean, and basically we're worried about misinformation, disinformation, which is the reason why we need to, giving me a platform like this is so terrific because then I get to tell you and you get to tell your neighbors and we can all basically tell people, don't worry about it, this is important. That is bad information. There's a, the Census Bureau has a page that's called the rumors page where you can actually send an email, rumors, I can't remember, I think it's rumors at 2020census.gov. You can actually send an email and say, is this true? Okay, and they'll, yes, that's how, that's how worried they are about this, right? So we're worried about that. Um, we're worried about some places in the state that are, have limited internet access, and then the federal government doesn't have as much money to do the, to give out swag. They haven't done enough tests on this, and we're not entirely sure how much effort they're gonna put into the non-response follow-up, and we're worried that then they might miss some people. So what we've been doing for the last year and a half is grass tops mobilization, talking to people to, who know people, who have networks, and basically trying to educate them about this process, make sure that they know where to go so that they can get information, make sure that they can dispel the myths if they need to. Um, and the important thing is that they can send the message, like I said before, that it's important that you self-respond when you get the mail, right? Because what, one of the things is, is I, the way I put this like pyramid together, we are the 15, we are the 25 percent. Okay, we're the ones who are getting educated. The 75 percent, when the mail, there's 75 percent of the population of this state is probably going to get the piece of paper in the mail and they go, "What's this?" And, well, we need to basically be informed so that we can say, "You know what that is? That's really important. That's that's where that really is uh, going to affect things in our fam to, that are important to our family and to our community." So what others are doing? Um, we have a statewide complete count committee that is chaired by Gary Locke and staffed by me. We're actually having a meeting next week of our, uh, of our complete count committee. Um, we have subcommittees like our higher education uh, subcommittee just put out a toolkit for higher education. Um, and we've done some other stuff on um, some security issues and stuff. And then you've got, this is just a smattering of the complete count committees that exist in the state. Here in Thurston County, FYI, the Thurston County Regional Planning Council is taking the lead on that. They just got $80,000 from the state to do some promotional stuff. They were, uh, Sarah Porter wanted to come today. Um, but she was, uh, was sick, so she sent me an email and was telling me that 
What they're really focused on right now is the point in time count, and they're hoping to be able to get some information out when they do that point in time count to the homeless uh, population to make sure that they're aware of the fact that it's coming. Thurston County has some money as well that they got from us, and Timberland Regional Library got uh, $80,000 from us, and they um, are starting to get um, organized um, on that. And then, you know, these good people have gotten some Somehow, somehow they've gotten some money probably from us. I know you have, Lynn. I don't know about Steele. <laughs> um, huh? So it's basically everybody's organizing and everybody's doing things uh, on this. What can you do? You can keep yourself informed by uh, looking at our website. Um, we, I'll show you some of the aspects of our web website. You can do a scan of your community and think about why would they have difficulties? Why would they have, uh, be afraid? You know, what, what, are the, what are the networks that you have? What are the email uh, lists that you have, the newsletters um, and stuff that can be used to send out the message about why this is so important? Um, you can join other people's organizing efforts that I'm sure Lynn and uh, Sherry are gonna tell us about. And then um, you can, uh, I can't remember what else is written on that slide. And then you can, um, the important thing is, is I think is to, Think about, oh, the other thing, there's a big one, is, is to organize um, places where people could come and like have a census party to fill out the form. I like to think, I, I like to make the joke, I live uh, up in, um, near the Tumwater Safeway, and I go to the Tumwater Safeway all the time. And you know, it's gonna be Girl Scouts cookie season. Well, last March, okay, they were standing outside the Safeway. Well, I think I'm just gonna kinda scooch up to them and say, hey guys, could you move us a little bit? I'm going to be here with my iPad. I'm going to catch you coming out of the Tumwater Safeway and say, did you fill out your form yet? <laughs> well, I've got, a, I've got an internet connection right now, and you can do it right here with me while you buy your Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> That's what I was thinking about doing. So, and then the other thing that you can do, and that we have our good people from the Census Bureau here, they need help recruiting. They definitely need help recruiting. Do you know, I sent out to our state, okay, I have this mailing list of, that I send out a weekly update to, and I said, my weekly update last week was just so embarrassed. I said, do you know that of 50 states in the United States, Washington State was called out as being low on their recruiting. We were one of 18 states that were uh, called out as being low in recruiting. That's an embarrassment. We shouldn't be that way. So we need to help these guys get people to apply. One of the things they might not tell you, it does take a little while. Okay, it can take time, but we, they need to have applications in their system so that they can basically pull and begin to interview and hire people. They're already hiring, they're gonna be offering, they're gonna be making offers for enumerators, for those door, door knockers, even this month, okay? But they, you have, there's a map that you can find on, on the census website where they basically do not have enough applications in lots part of this state. Okay, in which they can pull. In fact, the people we need to call out are Watcom and Skagit. They're doing a fine job. They got their numbers up, okay? But the rest of us, we all got about 20% uh, of, of the needs that they have is, is the rest of our counties. So there's another thing you can do. When you tell people to go out and self-respond, tell them also to go online and sign up to help the Census Bureau. Is that a good, did I do a good job? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So I told you about our website. This is our website, and basically, it's kind of organized. I see, you'll see I got a little arrow there to our toolkits. If you want any toolkits, there's tons of toolkits for all kinds of different populations. Okay, you've got the Washington State Agency Toolkit. You've got our toolkit for higher education, but there's not even, uh, not just our toolkits. You've got the Asian Americans uh, for, um, for justice a toolkit. There, there's all kinds of toolkits on there. There's a National Association of Latino Elected Officials. They have a toolkit. Um, there's a disability toolkit on there. There's all kinds of stuff that's um, on there, okay? Then you also have, um, you can find the, a lot of the stuff that I have here. In fact, all of this stuff, all of this stuff is available for download on our website. There's something called promotional materials. This, in particular, this one, is available in 50 different languages for download uh, on our website. The scams document is available in 12 different languages on our website. 
You can find all, all of this was taken off our, our website. And the resources section on the right side is where you can find most of these materials for download and for use. And you can also order materials from us. I have to say, if you put in order today, you won't get that stuff until the middle of February. But you can see here we've got mailers, we've got a trifold brochure, we've got um, posters, horizontal and uh, vertical, in English and in Spanish. Okay, so most of our stuff is in English and Spanish. It's just this, these two that we actually did in more languages than um, that. So you can go find our stuff and you can also follow our uh, complete count committee um, there. Um, that's our little thing, 10 minutes, 10 questions, 10 years. And that's me. In case you have, any, if you have any questions, feel free to call me. I really try to be very, very respons responsive and I'll be glad to help you. I don't want people to be out there spreading bad information. So just Ask me and I'll let you know. Okay? That's me. Hi, I'm Sherry Sullivan from um, Cielo. And I, I have a very short presentation because um, what I want to talk about is how a group like Cielo, which is a nonprofit, you may know, you may be familiar with it, it's based in Olympia, we have a, a big growing office in Shelton and a new office in Belfair, and we've been around for 20 years. We're, uh, we serve the Latinx community um, with uh, a whole array of wraparound um, programs, uh, the three main programs are educational services, English and other educational classes, computing, um, sewing actually, um, some technical classes, business, starting a business and, and other things. Um, we have a um, um, victims of crime uh, program which uh, is offered in Spanish all, all of our programs are bilingual, bicultural at least, but we now have um, in the Shelton office um, several staff who are uh, Guatemalan indigenous speakers, and so we're able to serve the Guatemalan community who speak um, either of two um, principal Guatemalan indigenous languages, and up in Belfair, that's also very useful. Our third program is a mental health program with counseling and um, uh, psychological support. Um, and um, that program is growing um, with a partnership with the University of Washington um, graduate students who are bilingual and, and come down and do their internships and help staff the services that we offer through that program. Um, it, Cielo is Growing has grown tremendously, especially in the last two years. And as you might imagine, we are very aware of how vulnerable and how um, cautious and frightened the people we serve are in these days, and how challenging it is um, for us to um, encourage them and, and provide some kind of opportunity for them to participate in the census. So um, we don't have uh, money per se to do this, so we are looking for partnerships. Um, but the, the basic plan um, at this moment is to um, offer uh, really census parties, as, as Lisa described um, them, um, having, having, we already have uh, uh, lots of folks coming in um, in the evenings to take English classes and, and our other classes. Um, we, we, would, we would host a, a gathering and facilitate it in Spanish and, and um, perhaps the indigenous languages as well. We have computers, people bring um, their, um, their um, smartphones or, or, or whatever in order to walk them through the online <laughs> registration. Um, we also w will likely partner with the um, Washington State Commission on Hispanic Affairs, who is um, putting together their own uh, packet of, of, of information. And um, with whatever group we um, 
can partner with, will offer this, these services in Shelton and in um, Olympia, at our Olympia offices, and as many times as we get people to come. But the, but the point is that Cielo's spaces are safe spaces, and people are comfortable there, they trust us, and they have a long relationship with us. And so we're hopeful that we can um, in, uh, involve more people in the census um, through through our um, our physical presence and our and our history of, of of support and encouragement and advocacy and so on, um, and I would ask if anybody um, would like to help in this effort, or if you are part of an organization or an individual that wants to um, provide some kind of support, we're looking for people who who might or organizations who might um, offer childcare or. Um, or snacks, or um, photocopy funding, or anything that will that will make this a success and and not draw on our other resources that are already allocated for other purposes. So um, that's our plan, and we're we're um, we're going to take it step by step and see what the needs are and and what what uh, the response is in the various communities. Um, we serve because Latinx folks are not just one uniform group. Many, many um, different cultures, microcultures are involved here and, and uh, different languages and cultural styles and norms. So it's a, um, a complicated uh, effort, but we're, we're confident going ahead that we can help make a difference. Thanks. I have some brochures of not so many as to pass out, but some to share if uh, anybody would like to know more information about CLO. Hi, good evening there. My name is Lynn Crowley, and I'm representing the Asian Pacific Islanders Coalition's South Puget Sound chapter, as was introduced earlier. Um, but I wanted to also, uh, you know, bring my welcome to all of you uh, who uh, probably are here, not only being part of the uh, League of uh, Voting Women, but also maybe from a lot of other organizations. Um, the reason why I wanted to say that is because I want to share with you that Asian Pacific Islanders Coalition uh, is a statewide organization. It's not actually one organization. We are a coalition of many, many different organizations in the local areas. So for example, for our South Puget Sound chapter in this area, in this area, uh, we have uh, different groups such as the Olympia Areas Chinese Association, the JACL, uh, you know, Olympia chapters, and uh, the Vietnamese uh, school, and uh, we have um, Cambodian uh, organizations, we have uh, Filipinos organizations. So there are many, many different ethnic uh, community organizations that are part of our group. So I wanted to uh, share that information. And uh, this particular statewide organization has been around for more than uh, 20 years. And our local chapter has been around for more than 17 years. And what we have been trying to do is to make sure that uh, that we are building bridges, uh, building coalition for all of those uh, who are advocating for uh, refugee and immigrant uh, um, uh, activities and uh, those who need help with their citizenships applications and also uh, for those folks who truly just wanted to have some multicultural you know opportunities to network with each other so um, our chapter 
uh, recently have uh, taken on the Census 2020 as part of our many activities, including photo registrations, legislative actions, and uh, candidate forums, leadership development. We do a lot of different activities, but we have decided to uh, take on the Census 2020 because we know this is a growing area for APIs. And uh, we have roughly about 12% of this certain county area's population that are made up of APIs. Uh, when I say APIs, probably some of you already know that, but I probably should spell that out. That's Asian Pacific Islanders. So uh, there are more than 60 different national, you know, uh, nationalities that are represented. And uh, as you already heard from Lisa earlier, um, there are nine languages that are going to be uh, having the census materials translated to. And uh, so it's not going to cover all of those different countries that we are trying to work with. Therefore, uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, answering the call from the Washington Census Alliance, who received $15 million last year uh, from the state to help with the census outreach. Of course, that's for the whole state. So uh, our area will only be getting about $40,000 uh, to work with our entire area. So what we have been already uh, planning to do with the funding is to make sure we will have a lot of different organizations involved. And uh, we try to uh, train so-called trusted messengers to help with, uh, you know, bilingual or multilingual outreach to our community members who may need some language assistance. Okay, so uh, those are works that we are currently doing. Uh, that even inclu included the uh, Latino, uh, you know, uh, groups that Sherry was just talking about. So we are going to be working in collaboration with each other uh, to do all of those outreach. And um, I wanted to also make sure for those of you who probably may not necessarily be aware that the reason why a lot of times people are undercounted is because a lot of folks have the misconception that if they are not citizens, they do not need to answer census. And that's totally a myth that is incorrect. <laughs> um, so, from uh, our outreach, we are going to try to help inform and educate the community to let people know that as long as you are living in an area that's more than six months, you should be counted. And that includes not only adults, uh, seniors, but also little kids, the young ones. So um, those are so-called the undercounted you know, populations that we are going to make a special effort to reach out to. Uh, I know that there are going to be other organizations that will be doing some other outreach too, but I do want to take this opportunity to share that information with you that we are hiring for the trusted messengers too, just like the Census Bureau. And uh, we are hoping for people who uh, like to do that will be able to kind of reach out to actually our communities directly and meet up with people who they already know and help recruit and, you know, help them to kind of fill up the census forms. So that is actually happening. We are going to be having a training actually this Saturday right away. So uh, so if you happen to know anyone who is interested in doing something like this and who is multilingual or bilingual, uh, please feel free to share that information with us later. I am the chair. Uh, co-chair for the South Pijuan chapter along with Brian Locke. 
um, but we are uh, having a Facebook page that you will be able to uh, contact us directly by texting or phone. And also, you will be able to um, uh, just write me by email, and I can give you uh, our email address, which is A-P-I-C dot South Puget Sound, all in one word, at gmail.com. Okay? So um, we do check those messages all the time, so feel free to send us the information. I am working uh, for the college also as a teacher, uh, so sometimes I may not be able to kind of answer questions right away uh, in a few hours, but usually I will try to get back to people you know, within a couple of hours along with my co-chair. Okay, so just wanted to kind of share those information with all of you first. And I did leave uh, language resource uh, information in the back. So for those of you who are interested in knowing what kind of languages are going to be covered, you know, by this census, yeah, I was going to say you are certainly welcome to take a look. And I can tell you right now, the language line is already up. Um, and they will be started uh, having staff uh, actually uh, staffing those phone lines beginning in March 2020. And the language line includes English, Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Russian, Arabic, te uh, Tagalog, uh, Pol Polish, French, Haitian, uh, Portuguese, Japanese, English for the Puerto Rico residents, and also Spanish, of course. Okay, so um, if you have any other question, like Sherry, I will be right here available uh, for you to access later if you are interested in joining us. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, we have time. Does anyone have question? General questions? Here, go ahead. As a guest teacher, I read roles in classrooms all over the district, and I'm quite aware of the ethnicity, a lot of Asian, for example, as well, but also at the universities and colleges, many of which, of course, are in this area as well. And I'm just wondering, the census count, does it take in foreign students that are living here in residence attending educational institutions? Go ahead. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, if anybody who lives in the United States gets counted. Yeah. Should I kiss it off? Mm -hmm. Yes. Foreign nationals are students. There's another question that often comes up that surprises mm -hmm. people. Yeah. There's another question with regard to that. Yes, foreign nationals living in the United States, anybody who's residing in the United States, except for maybe if they you know, just flew in for a week-long meeting, that's not, okay, but everybody else is. But one, just because you're asking about college students, another question that comes up often is uh, kids who are uh, living abroad, uh, maybe on a study abroad program, are not counted, are not counted, which somewhat surprises people. So they can be citizens, but they're not living here, so they're not counted. But foreign nationals are counted, yes. Okay. One more question. Um, what if you're someone who's hosting or uh, writing to travel nurses who tend to stay in 13 week periods of time? So you're the homeowner and you're renting to people. So those people often are not residents of the state that they're contracting with. How is that counted? Right. Can you repeat the question? Sure. So if you're a homeowner and you're renting out your home to travel nurses who work off of usually a 13-week contract. Um, they're usually maintaining residency in the state they're coming from, but they're living in your house. I'm wondering how they're counted. That's a really interesting one. I would generally, yeah, that's a whole subculture, yeah? I, I have to find out about that one. I would actually say that they would be, because it's where you live or work, where you live or sleep most of the time. So the homeowner would declare that this residence in their house? The, then I don't think, that's the thing, is that since they don't live and sleep most of the time there, no. 
What do you mean by most yeah. of the time? That's, that's, that's one of the things. Six months. Huh? It needs yeah. to be six months. Yeah. 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 Six. Okay. okay. And now a uh, little recruitment announcement from Karen. Would you like to come up and... Um, we, we know that we're going to put grand effort into getting everyone first time around, but as your, your folks will be doing follow-up, is that it? Why don't you come up to the mic? So. My name is Karen Burke, and I'm a recruiting assistant for 2020 Census. And I think the question is what to tell them what the people do. Uh, what we're hiring the most of are enumerators or census takers uh, and then supervisors. We have other jobs as well, but what we're hiring the bulk of it are the enumerators for the follow-up when there's no response. So like she already covered, you're going to get something in the mail to respond to. You have many ways to do the census. But those people that don't, after two or three tries that we've tried to get them to, these people, the enumerators, census takers, will go out and ask them those questions. That's the simplest way to tell you that. But you, uh, if you know they have to be 18 or older to apply to uh, be sworn in, there's no top stop. They can be as old as they want. <laughs> they have to have. Uh, they do have to be able to drive those, and they have to be a, a U.S. citizen. Uh, Let's see what was the other. But also, when they apply, they can put in the hours they want to work, the days they want to work. It's very, very flexible because we need people at many different places at different hours and different days. So, uh, someone, a lot of people will work part time or full time jobs and still apply here and get some extra money for a short period of time. The positions are all part time, pretty much temporary. I've been in the job for over a year, and I'm still a temporary employee. I work full time pretty much with recruiting, but my job will end at the end of February. So any questions about the hiring itself? Uh, the pay is $18 an hour for the enumerators, and it's 57 and a half cents a mile, or whatever the government's paying for business miles. And right now, it just went down to a half a cent. So it's for mileage, any business miles. So basically, they're paid from the time they drive out of their driveway and drive home as long as it's all business. So they're paid the hourly rate and they're paid the miles. You had your hand up. Okay, but you need your own car then. Yes. Yes, you do. You need and your own car. And she's at a table right over here. Yeah. yeah, I won't take any more time. But do come and see us because we definitely need people. Family, friends, anyone. Thank you. Well, not anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.